All right, testing, testing. Welcome to CS4510. The camera is still not fixed. Uh, last time we talked about the relativization barrier, uh, oracles, um, and hierarchy theorems. And we talked about how a lot of these early theorems in complexity theory kind of dealt with computation only in a black box manner. You have an input and you have an output. And the reason for that, in my opinion, um, there's some motivation about why, it's, why these proofs are so accessible and easy. You have a machine, the Turing machine, and it runs. And then you only have to care about the input and output. It's kind of a very, simple, very easy simplification. And the motivation I want to give to you why those kind of proofs exist is, has to do with actually the difficult, an intuition from hardware. So I was looking at like, physical Turing machines on the internet. And I, there's all these like, uh, different mechanical ones that are made. And here's a Lego one. All right, so this guy built a Lego Turing machine. He has somehow the tape head is, is flipping the bits on the thing. But if you think about it, this isn't really a Turing machine. This is a computer that simulates a Turing machine. Okay, whatever connects mind Lego mind storms, you know, what, I don't know what it's called, uh, does. He has implemented the functionality of the Turing machine on top of whatever this computer already is. So somehow the Turing machine exists here after it's not a Genesis computer. It's sort of like the, a, a, another computer came first, and then this computer came, right? This computer is, uh, that computer, though, is built on circuits. I would like to see a Turing machine that was not built on circuits first that is just a Turing machine that's mechanical, purely mechanical uh, in a physical way, right? So we can see it's, it's got some very complicated mechanisms and all, but the control is being done uh, digitally through digital circuits, right? Um, and, I only, and I finally found one which is this guy, uh, which is, his is made entirely out of wood, okay? He's somehow built an entire Turing machine, and of course I have to play everything at two times speed. He's built not only a Turing machine out of wood, but a universal Turing machine. So here, you can see there's a little table, and with those pegs he inserts into the table, you can change the transition function of the Turing machine. It, of course, does not have bounded infinite tape. It has infinite, does not have infinite tape, but no Turing machine uses the infinite tape in a useful way. It has these kind of pegs that slide in and out, and there's a tape head that moves up and down. And as he, as he rotates, he applies some sort of energy, uh, rotational energy here. Uh, it, there's a head uh, on the device that moves the tape left or right conditionally on this, on this sensor, this wooden sensor device that reads where, what the position of the peg is. The fantastic thing to me is how, he has a document on the internet well that explains in detail how this mechan the mechanical parts of this device work, and I still, for the life of me, cannot figure it out. The most difficult part is having a device move conditionally. The, having, you know, like a, I, I've imagined doing something like this with bike parts, and you have... Um, I'm really interested in this, the mechanism here for conditional moving. Somehow, the, the, the device doesn't just move one way, obliviously, it's able to conditionally move left or right, which is exactly what the Turing machine does. Uh, no idea how that works and why that's so difficult to, to implement. But you can see, you can just look at it. That is supposed to be a computer, but I have no idea. I really don't know what's going on here, right? So if you, to bring this back to the analogy about re relativization, what is the internals of a computation if we started with the Turing machine? It's whatever this is supposed to be. And I really don't know what's going on. Okay? I understand, like, when I look at the tape part, I understand exactly what's going on. But I have no idea. Oh, well, okay, whatever. I have no idea what's going on uh, with that, to, to be honest. Meanwhile, in the hardware world, the first computers were not built on Turing machines. Alan Turing invented the Turing machine to solve you know, the Hilbert's decision problem. He wasn't immediately interested in building a mechanical Turing machine, but he, he actually spent the rest of his career. Uh, doing that at various uh, uh, jobs in England. Um, it was actually, there was more success with Boolean circuits, right? So Turing invented uh, the Turing machine in 1936. Uh, Shannon invented Boolean circuits, Claude Shannon, in his master's thesis in 1937. It's crazy that these two devices came out of just two papers. Um, uh, and I didn't even watch this video to see what's going on. But basically, uh, circuits, everyone knows what a Boolean circuit is. I don't think I have to go too de deep into that. Uh, all the books do. They start, you know, a circuit is a directed acyclic graph. But the simplicity of a circuit allows it to be engineered very efficiently, right? What is a circuit? It's just a hard-coded lookup table of size 4. You have gates, which have two fan in and one fan out. You can, of course, change these parameters. And then the important part is that the circuits are composable. That's really the important part, right? Turing machines are composable only in a sort of hardwired sense, right? If we took his Turing machine, 
and we built an identical copy, his wooden one, and we wanted to like connect them. So when one Turing machine was finished, the second one started, something like this. That would that would be insanely complicated. Um, this is a this is an example of logic gates that are built out of wires. Excuse me, out of dominoes. So it's so simple and mechanically simple. I think this is an XOR gate, right? So one or the other can go, but not both, right? If you wanted to compose circuits, you just put them next to each other. It's kind of ridiculously simple. So in that motivation, Boolean circuits uh, have a much easier, um, a far easier uh, ability to go inside and in, into the internals than Turing machines do. And so that was a, there's a large motivation then for us to study complexity theory from the perspective of uh, circuits. So today what we're going to do is re-talk about a lot of the parts of complexity theory under uh, a circuit model rather than a uh, machine-based model, because that will help us get in, into the insides, right? So, uh, and there's other circuits you can find on YouTube of people doing, you know, simple adders, binary adders, uh, and they involve, like, um, water or, you know, marbles or something. Uh, we didn't even talk about how hard a multiplication Turing machine would be, but somehow people are able to make multiplication gates. Very simple, right? Um, yeah, so we can just close these. And here's a... Did I do it right? Let's see. All right. This is a Boolean circuit. Um, don't read what the function is called. Just don't look at those words. Just look at the diagram. Okay, a uh, circuit is, is a directed acyclic graph, which is composed of, and I could have drawn this on the board, but I didn't want to, right? Uh, it's composed of several nodes. It's directed, certainly. There's no loops in it. You can't have a thing go back to itself. Um, in our model, I'm sure hardware, whatever, they, these guys do whatever they want. Uh, there's a, some fixed circuit basis. In, in the common case, it's and, ors, and nots. Sometimes I've seen ands, xors, and nots. I've seen uh, nand, of course. Maybe you've known nand as a complete a basis. Um, if, and uh, a circuit consists of a sequence of these gates and inputs. So here there are four inputs and a bunch of gates, and then there's a single output. So this computes a function with four inputs and one output, a, boole a Boolean function. Without looking at the name of the function, what would you think that this function computes? What is it called? The parity function, yes. It's, so basically, this computes the XOR of the four input wires. Okay? The way I would have thought about this is to notice immediately parts of the structure. This whole kind of sub-circuit is repeated here, here. So whatever it's doing to X1 and X2, it's doing to X3 and X4 first. So there's a symmetry between X1, X2, X3, and X4 there. Then notice that this is the same thing. This is also a sub-circuit that's just the same circuit which takes on those input wires. Um, so it's going to just do whatever it does to the output of x1 and x2 that is x3 and x4. And it turns out that uh, this exactly is just an XOR gate. So it's just XORing the XORs, which is just XOR. It's, it's a symmetric function. Um, one thing to note here, which may not be true in other foundations of like uh, digital logic, is that the it, you have to fix the model when you talk about circuit complexity. Here, we, here let's say that the input has... Uh, fan in, the number of input wires is two. But the number of output wires is whatever we want, right? Uh, this is what makes circuits different than formulas. A formula is a circuit which is a tree. Uh, the difference between a circuit and a formula is that uh, a circuit, the intermediary computations of a circuit can be reused. So for example, after we've computed whatever this is, it's re the value is sent here and here. And so that value used twice at these two outgoing wires. A formula, though, is a tree. Like, if you think of quite literally a formula, it has, it has a string representation of, a, uh, of a symbols. You can take a tree, and then you can kind of fold it down into a, a little string, right? So you, would, you, couldn't, you can only do that. This is only a tree if there's no outgoing wires of, 
the fan out wires of one or more, uh, two or more. So this is clearly a circuit and not a formula. And there is a difference between when you measure the, com the formula complexity versus the circuit complexity. We're, of course, more interested in the circuit complexity. Formula complexity, though, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting in its own right. Um, but just to know that they are different. Um, there's something else kind of, if we're trying to come at the same formulation where we talk about complexity classes and we talk about computers, uh, there is a difference immediately between a circuit and a Turing machine. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that a Turing machine can accept inputs that are arbitrarily long. This circuit can only accept inputs that are four bits. Uh, and that's a problem. Turn on the light in the whiteboard. Oh. Forgot my obligatory. Fat marker. This is 19A, right? Second to last lecture. Um, so a Turing machine, a Turing machine, right? It has uh, some infinite tape, and the answer is, the, excuse me, the input is written on the tape in some way, and then there's a tape head which reads to it and uh, does it in some way, right? And it, the input can be arbitrarily long. But a, uh, a circuit, right, as we described, is going to look like something like this. That was pretty good. Um, it has a fixed input of whatever number of bits. So what, how do we get around this? What we do is we define, instead of a fixed circuit, what we define is, uh, is a circuit family. And a circuit family is, is, a, is a set of circuits, sequence of circuits, C0, C1, C2, uh, such that uh, if, you want, if you have an input of a specific length, you get to choose the circuit of that size and then run it on that circuit. So uh, that gives us the ability to accept arbitrary inputs because we now have an infinite list of circuits, and we can just choose the ones that we want. The motivation for this is if you recall the parity uh, function, the parity circuit that we had on the board, it was just composed of other ones for four bits. You could do the same thing with six bits or five bits, whatever, right? You can just keep making other circuits. If you had to, you believe you could. So although that was a circuit that computes the parity function on only four bits, you, gun to your head, probably could make a circuit family uh, to compute the parity function on n bits, on any arbitrary n bits if you want. Um, a circuit family is explicitly non-uniform. So a Turing machine is what we call uniform. Uh, it takes on inputs of any size and outputs. It can, uh, in the decision model, of course, it just says yes or no. This, but it can output things of any size. The circuits are non-uniform. They take on inputs of a fixed size, uh, and only a fixed size, and they output of a fixed size as well if they're computing circuits and not just decision circuits, right? But um, a circuit family is what we call is, is a non-uniform. So this gives us an ability to study a family of circuits, and then we can take the complexity as a function of the sizes of the family immediately, because a fixed circuit is just a finite object, right? There's nothing really much there to study. Uh, but then we can decide uh, a language this way. We can say, like, um, uh, we say a circuit family decides a language. L if, uh, we say W is an L, uh, if and only if, uh, we go to the circuit that corresponds to the length of W, so we choose the nth circuit, where W is the length of N. We choose that circuit, we give into the input wires the word W, and if that circuit has a single output wire of one, then we say that that circuit family decides the language. So here's our first fixed sort of ad hoc patch into studying circuits into the framework we've already had of complexity theory. Right. So any questions on the non-uniform model of computation? It's actually very important. It's, it's extremely important that we don't define that the function which takes on n and outputs c of n. Uh, this need not be computable.
This is, this is uh, uh, surprisingly important. We don't actually care about this, the difficulty in synthesis of the circuits. So let's say I wanted to make circuits for SAT or something. I don't really care about the difficulty in creating a circuit, uh, how hard it is to program the circuit. We actually only care about the size of the circuit. What is the complexity of the size of the circuit? So we actually don't even require that the function be computable at all. Like, and this allows for circuit families to quote unquote decide undecidable languages in some sense. Um, you could have a circuit family that decides halt, but if, if you would then require that the, the, this function not be computable. And of course, certainly if this function is computable, then it does, the circuit family has to decide a decidable language, like no, normally decidable by a Turing machine. Are we only concerned with circuits who kind of solve like almost decision problems where it's a yes or no, and not search where like a puts number five or like an answer? In this case, yes. Uh, imagine you did do search or something, right? There you go. So, uh, but there's, there, of course, there's, uh, we, you, you can study search just as well, but there is a search, there's a very simple search to decision uh, transformation that you can always do, right? If you have a black box that just tells you the answer, you can, through, you know, even linearly many queries, you can get the black box to tell you what the answer is. So the decision problem is a much simplification of it than, is it simple enough of a simplification that the search problems just kind of abstract everything, right? So now how do we study uh, the complexity? We say uh, size of f of n uh, is equal to the class of languages A decidable by circuit families bounded by uh, f of n. So, like uh, for all i uh, ci, the size of ci is less than the uh, than f of n. Excuse me, uh, uh, fi, right? Uh, with up to big O and all that, right? So, like, we can consider the size of these functions required, uh, the size of these circuits required to compute a certain uh, specific function. Um, and as the, uh, of course, to compute on more inputs, the sizes of the circuits, of course, have to increase. And we're concerned with really how much they increase versus how much they don't, right? We might be say, you know, it might be convenient to know that a specific kind of circuit family to compute a function requires exponentially sized circuits. And that means as more we include more input wires, the size of the function has to grow exponentially with that. We might say, okay, a function is nice to compute if it's polynomially sized, right? Linearly sized circuits and so on. So that's the measure we put on uh, the circuits. That's the way we measure it. Is the, and of course, what is the size of a circuit? I have to make sure that I say that. It's the number of gates. It's not, the, not necessarily the depth, but we could study the depth complexity. That's in itself an important thing or a combination of that or crossing wires, whatever. Uh, really, the only thing we care about is the gates, because all of those end up being a function of that. The gates is, is, is essential. So how do we relate the size of certain circuit families uh, to the size, uh, to the time complexity of languages? That's what we really want to do first. We want to, we have, we've developed a very good theory of computation, of complexity theory so far. We understand P and NP and these things. And we know very well what an efficient computation is in terms of P. We want to be, first, first thing we want to do is relate the size of uh, a circuit to an equivalent language that it computes uh, and in, the, in the uniform sense. We want to form a first relationship between a uniform model of computation and this new non-uniform model of computation. And uh, the proof, I mean, the statement of the theorem is, is quite simple. If, if, if a language is decidable in time, f of n, uh, what do you think the size of a circuit to decide the same language is? Just get, this is to, uh, there's no expectation of you knowing the answer, but I'm curious if you guys have an intuition. Can you repeat the question? If I have a language which takes f of n time, we haven't even talked that circuits are Turing complete. But suppose they are. I'll talk about it in a second. What would you guess that the size of the circuit that compute the same thing is? It, 
It is, uh, we're going to prove that the, if, a, if a language is decidable in time f of n, it can be computed by a circuit family of size uh, f squared of n. So two things immediately. One, here's a hard question. Are circuits Turing complete? I think so too, but I think the correct answer is supposed to be that I don't know. Uh, I took uh, an, a course, a uh, cryptography course, um, called Secure Multiparty Computation, and basically there was an algorithm in there that uh, a protocol where any n players can come together and compute a function and keep their inputs to the function private. And I was curious how they represented the computation in this theoretical way. So he says, next time we'll talk about how to represent the computation anyway. Uh, and I'm expecting something Turing machine or programmatic level. And he says, okay, first represent the function as a circuit. And I remember uh, being surprised and shocked that that was possible because uh, to me, immediately, a, a circuit was not um, Turing complete. If you're an engineer, it might obviously be because all the computers are built on circuits. But uh, the Turing machine obviously is Turing complete because it, you know, it's made in our own image. Turing has this beautiful argument about why anything naturally computable is computable by a Turing machine. But there's immediate counterexamples you can make to why circuits shouldn't feel Turing complete. And the one I thought of was, of course, there's no infinite looping program for a circuit. Okay, what's the deal with that? I mean, shouldn't there should be an infinitely looping program for a circuit? That's a really naive thought in hindsight now, but that was a motivation uh, that I had. And second, there is no apparent argument you could make about, you know, the Turing machine has this beauty associated with it. Uh, the circuit is a pachinko machine. It's just you put the marbles in the right slots and then the right output comes out. I don't really get what, how this thing is capable of thinking somehow. And it's a little, but maybe, maybe thinking in general is like, I mean, our brains is just a bunch of wires. Maybe those are, who am I to say that it needs to be, uh, look, it looks, needs to look like us. Maybe, maybe we really do look like that or something, right? Um, the, 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 res, the resolution to like, is there an infinitely looping circuit is really that the circuits are, we only care in complexity theory about the decidable languages. And all decidable languages are the ones that halt. And of course the circuits halt because they literally, you've set the wires and like, it goes as fast as the electrons go. And you get the output. It always gets the output. There's no infinite process, I think. So the circuits correspond, the, circuit, the languages that the circuits decide correspond also to the decidable languages. So, and those are the ones we care about anyway. So it doesn't matter the fact there's no infinitely looping circuit. Because all the comp we define a computation as one which halts and one that we that'll tell us the answer. If it's just wasting time and not telling us the answer, it's not a computation. And of course, the circuit's not going to compute it. So, in ones that matter, the circuits are able to compute, sort of, so to speak. Second thing is that this says not only that the, are the circuits capable of computing things which we can compute with Turing machines, because this is what this class represents, uh, they're capable of doing so efficiently. This is only a quadratic speed up. So immediately you may think of Savage's theorem and you may think that uh, if we have a polynomial si time algorithm, we immediately have a polynomial size circuit. That's the, that's the thing. It's, it is a quadratic speed up, but um, it, that's what it is. Um, proof, you, how would you guys prove this? Again, just throwing random questions out there I don't expect any answers to. Maybe I do, I don't know. So, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I don't really have an idea, but I just want to get a deeper intuition. So if you have a linear function, um, you can represent that with the circuit family of size n squared. Correct. So it's kind of like for each step of the computation, you require, um, I guess, couldn't be a linear amount because right n squared would go to n to the fourth, right? Not n cubed. The answer is two words: Cook and Levin. Recall that we took a uh, computation history of a machine, and then we just converted that to a CNF formula, right? 
we did this a really complicated ands and ors and nots in there. Just repeat the proof, but instead of a formula, get a circuit. That's all you have to do. So at a high level idea, let's say we had symbols like um, Q0, 1, 0, blank, and maybe we had QH. First thing you want to do is these are not binary symbols. And uh, let's map these to some constantly sized more um, uh, binary alphabet. So let's say this is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, or something, right? So you fix the, you, you first you map all the symbols that you need to, a, to an alphabet like that. And then what you do is you just put the sequence, you, you just put the configurations in order. So you say Q, Q0, 1, 1, 1, blank is my canonical example of a Turing machine which loops over the, the ones and changes the zeros. And what you're going to do then is just at each level, you're just going to create a small circuit gadget that takes on, it, here I'm drawing with only three input wires, but of course because we've mapped Q011 to the appropriate ones and zeros, this actually would have nine input wires. You create a little gadget that looks like that. And then you just put the, uh, these intermediary circuits between each levels. And then this next, the outputs of these wires is going to be 0, Q0, 1, 1, blank, right? Something like this. Um, and this solves a, an immediate problem you may not even thought of. First off, Turing machine, Turing complete. The difference between a Turing machine and DFA is the memory structure. It stores things. Where does, it, where does a circuit store things? A circuit doesn't have RAM. Where does it store things? Now we know. It stores them on the intermediary wire values. That is the RAM snapshots, is, is that sequence as we go down. And to do better justice than ever I could ever draw a picture of, I have to open the projector again. So this is a screenshot I showed previously for the circuit sat in the CNF proof. Um, basically, they try to prove circuit sat is NP complete, but this is also a proof that the you can also use this as a proof that the circuits have quadratic size over their, the, the size of their program. So basically, they represent the configuration of the machine as each row, and they have a generic circuit inserted at each level of the machine. And that circuit takes on a configuration of the machine and also puts a configuration of the machine. And that's it. That's the whole proof. Uh, you just do this. You have to be, you, first off, you have to convince yourself that this is possible, that you can, using only some fixed circuit basis, let's suppose right now it's and, or, and not, and the basis does matter for complexity. Of course, certain gates will help speed things up for you. Um, let's suppose that you have, a, just, you were able to build this. You should probably convince yourself that you could build this M out of uh, ands, ors, and nots. Okay, so just put a bunch of them in the row. Uh, this is the way this, the, the CL, CLRS book does not define a uh, Turing machine, so they go with this high-level argument. The Sipser book does define a Turing machine, and it, they prove circuit status NP complete using uh, a, more, a similar diagram that we're used to. So here, they go at a, 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 the exact same idea that we did for the Cook-Levin theorem. You put the configurations in, a, in, in rows, and then you have to stitch the configurations together using the two by three window and the start row and the end row and so on. Um, but then he, de he defines it at the very low level of circuit. So he talks about this window, which sh is shaped like a Tetris piece here uh, in the middle. And he explains how to wire up this Tetris piece. So that would be the Tetris piece. And then he explains how to wire it up a little bit in a little more detail using ands and ors and not gates and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, you just end up with a proof that if this machine ex uh, runs in time f of n, then there is a computation history of that. And then you can just simply convert the computation history into a circuit. And if you were to take your multimeter and you were to slow down time so the circuit somehow didn't finish instantly, and you were to measure the intermediary, intermediary wire values of this circuit, those would correspond exactly to the configurations of the machine. Now, here's how we finish the proof. What is the size of the circuit? Rho times height. The height is what? Close. If the machine takes f of n time, the height is going to be the number of steps it takes, which is going to be f of n. 
then, this, then the width is going to be the space. So the, the computation history of the machine is basically plotted through space-time. Uh, time by space. But because we know each unit of space requires a unit of time, we can bound the space by the time. So we also know that this, the width is also going to be f of n. So we have basically f of n by f of n squared. And you base times height, you get uh, f of n squared. Uh, that completes the proof. That's it. That's the beauty of the cook levin theorem, is that it allows you to wave your hands and not have to do any more programming, because you did it one time, and then you can convince yourself, I believe I could probably do that again if I have to, and then you never have to, right? So I, that's much better than I could ever draw as the diagram, but suppose I finished it, right? This would be f of n height, because that's the, um, the time of the machine, and then you would bound the space, of course, by f of n as well. So you get, you get f squared of n as a very trivial bound. I want to mention, though, that this, cause this is a quadratic speed up, a quadratic increase, in the complexity, but you can actually do better. Uh, and we won't get into it, but there is a, it's a very simple result, and I'm not sure if it can be, can be improved, but you can actually do not f squared, but f log f of n. f of n log f of n. So an even smaller speed up, asymptotically, you can create, a, create such a circuit. And that should be believable, because if you think at each intermediary step of the circuit, most of the gates are going to be like identity gates. Only a small portion near the head is going to do any changing. So like, here's an identity gate, here's an identity gate. Only near the head does the values change. So there we go. Circuits, Turing complete, not only Turing complete, but efficient. Right? All right, any questions on, on this, this proof? Now we know that every efficient computation has an efficiently sized circuit. I'm going to take a little detour before coming back to this. So to take a small detour, we're going to talk back about a uniform class and then relate this back to circuits. So we're going to talk about Turing machines, uh, which uh, take advice. So a, a Turing machine which takes advice is quite literally a machine with a second tape on it that you've written down the answers before the machine has started. Whatever answers you want, you can write down on the tape. And then you have to consider the relative power of the Turing machine to the answers that have been written down. It's kind of similar to an oracle, but the machine doesn't make queries and re receive binary responses. It just has some of the answers written down, and it has a bounded amount of answers written down. Um, so again, here's the, here's the machine. Uh, and, and you could do, like, uh, there's, the in, there's, the, there's the work tape, and then here's the advice tape. Uh, right, something like this. Um, and we can define the class uh, for a class C and function F define um, C, uh, I don't know what you call it, C slash F uh, to be the class of languages decidable. by C machines with advice of size F. And again, the advice can be anything. And you can program the machine to know that you're going to tell it the answers to something. And it won't know what those answers are, but you can just tell it that it has those answers. So uh, for example, for any class C, what is C slash 0? Yeah. Right. If you give it no advice, certainly it's the same machine. Um, here's one. What if we took polynomial time and augmented it by exponential advice, two to the n advice? And here again, the 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 advice given is a function of the input. So this machine is a polynomial time machine. It's only allowed to make polynomial number of steps. 
it has an input of size n, but on the second tape, it's given, it's pre-written there, a string of two to the n. This is, seems more powerful because it has answers, and you can decide what those answers are. How powerful is this class? Bigger. XP. It's even bigger. Super X. It's even, it can, this contains undecidable languages even. This actually contains every single language. Why? So first off, suppose the two to the n advice, there's how many strings of length n are there? Two to the n. So choose your string to be a sequence of ones and zeros if that string is in halt or not. So it's a characteristic string of the two to the n, of the strings of length n that would be in halt or not. So it just, if, if it, you can decide halt with an advice machine, with this much advice, by simply giving it the answers to halt. And it says, I, your, it already knows that's the answers to halt. It just go reads the answers. And using this, the advice machine can decide halt. So it's, it is bigger than, and certainly it's bigger than P, uh, but it's actually too big. This is like way too much advice. It doesn't even have to read all the advice. It can just read one, it just needs one bit of the advice if it knows what, that's what the answer is. Um, right, so uh, what is P uh, ma, uh, F if F equals 1 infinitely often? So F is not bounded now. It is an infinite string. It's got infinite advice, perhaps. How does it being equal to 1 relate to the advice it gives? So f is going to be a string of zeros and ones. Uh, here it's bounded by size. So the string has size 2 to the n. Here the string has size 0. Here the string is infinite. But it appears to be 1 infinitely often. So 1 appears infinitely often instead of 0. So there could be an infinitely long string where just after a period it's just all zeros. But suppose 1 appears infinitely often on that tape somehow. Just to be clear, it Zero can appear, it's just one appears infinitely often. One or zero. Okay. It's just, it is a randomly infinite string, suppose. But it, you get to tell it the answers before you start the machine. Doesn't seem what? Doesn't seem what? Like it would be useful. Because if, because if you have all zeros and that doesn't do anything, then what would having all ones do? Exactly. That's why it has to be sporadically ones and zeros. Because that's, there's a Kolmogorov argument for that. That doesn't contain any more information. Think of it that way. I don't remember if this is equal to the same thing. But I think certainly there are undecidable languages in this. Because you can put, every language has a characteristic string. Right, an infinite string of ones and zeros representing a one or a zero if that, string, if that string is lexicographically in the language or not. So just choose the advice to be the description of halt, the characteristic string of halt, and suddenly this contains halt. Um, so this can also decide some undecidable languages in there. Um, if, like, uh, if f is like asymptotically less than g, uh, what do we know about the class with advice f versus the class with advice g? Yeah, and there is some finagling I have to make sure on that, like infinitely often and so on. But certainly more advice basically should just give you more power to decide. Um, why do we care about this? So what is uh, P slash poly? P slash poly is the class of, is what? Is the polynomial time Turing machines, which also have po polynomial advice. Very reasonable class to consider when we're considering things. So the machine runs in polynomial time and also only has polynomially many answers, right? Um, the reason I'm introducing machines that take advice at all is because this class ends up being exactly equal to the circuits that have polynomial size. So this is the notation that we use when we talk about polynomial circuit families. We don't actually use this one, even though this one I think makes more sense. It was later proved that it was equivalent to the advice. Uh, actually, in, this, when the advi in the paper by Karp and Lipton, that which, introduced, which also proved the Karp-Lipton theorem, but introduced this, this, this about Turing machines which take advice, it was proven 
that it's actually the p slash poly is equivalent to uh, the class of languages which have polynomial size circuit families. So we just use this notation for polynomial size circuit families instead of this one. So, and of course, when we studied feasibility in the uniform model of computation, we talked about what class? We talked about P, right? Uniform uh, computation. We said P was a good class uh, that represents efficient algorithms because of composability and all these other features, right? Um, we need to talk about an efficient class for what is an efficient, what, what has efficient circuits, small circuits? What kinds of problems have small circuits? And we need to talk about a class that represents our intuitive notion of efficiency. And that, of course, and that we're going to just continue the analogousness of that polynomial size, polynomial time, same thing. Polynomial size circuits is good. That means it's a good circuit. Not polynomial size circuits is bad, bad circuits, right? Easy. So we're going to prove, though, this. We're going to prove that p slash poly, uh, it, polynomial, it, just for this proof, this is going to mean polynomial time machines which take polynomial advice. This is going to mean cir polynomial size circuits. Uh, once we prove that they're equal, then this is going to mean whichever one we want it to, which is usually going to be the circuit definition. And then I'll never write this again. Um, so how do we prove two classes are equal? Double set containment. Great, double set containment. OK. And this is going to go much easier than you think. Um, let me make sure I'm not skipping a single step. OK. Uh, first, we want to prove that every polynomial time Turing machine with polynomial advice has a polynomial size circuit family. So let L be an element of that. Uh, so there exists a polytime advice machine. Uh, to decide L. And it may be handicapped because it doesn't know what the advice is beforehand, of course, but when you help it out with the polynomial advice, it correctly decides L. How would I build a polynomial size circuit family for L? Cook-Levin theorem. Yeah, there we go. Pavlovian, Cook-Levin theorem. That's the only technique that we know how to build circuit families so far, so that could have been the only answer. So what you do is you repeat the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem. Here goes Q0, 1, 1, 1, space. And then you have, this thing is going to be polynomial time. So this is going to be poly-sized here. This is going to be poly-sized here, right? Because we have a polynomial time Turing machine. Uh, but we need to program the advice in. So what do we do? We write the polynomial advice over here. This is also polynomial, right? And what do we do? We just literally wired it in. We wired it in. Let's say the advice is A1, A2, da, 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 A, T, something. We just literally wire in the advice into when the machine reads it. Or just put it as part of the input. Just increase the input, and then same thing. Just the wires get intermingled, OK? Congrats, we now have, that's a polynomial size circuit. It's going to be poly plus poly plus some poly plus some linear to the, you know, something. I don't know. Uh, QED, right? That part's done. We believe that there's a polynomial size circuit. I don't have to do any more. This is the great part about not having to do programming. I can just wave my hands. Where is the, in the advice tape, where are the letters? I just made them A1 through AT, just for call them something, right? Whenever this machine would read A1, in the circuit, we're going to wire that value appropriately into the thing. Or we could have also just programmed it at the input level. We could have just increased the size of the input and kept it there, right? Certainly a two-tape Turing machine uh, by the Cook, you can, the Cook Levin theorem proof was simplified by our use of a one-tape Turing machine. Proof still works for a two-tape Turing machine. And it doesn't matter that the tape was blank at the start. So just suppose it wasn't, and then it's a normal computation. Right, so it still have, a, and what's important is that we still have a polynomial size circuit. That's what the, 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 the most important part of it is. Um, this is really the power of the Cook-Levin theorem because you can just be like, I can imagine doing the programming. I don't have to actually do it. I actually don't know how to do the programming. I have no idea how I would ands and or gates that in there, right? But I believe I could know, I could find out. So uh, as long as I'm not pressed on the details, it, it's correct. If I am pressed on the details, I have to go read something. But. 
Um, okay, that part of the that part of the proof is done. Let's do the second part. Suppose we have a polynomial size circuit family. Uh, give me an equivalent polynomial time Turing machine to decide the same language, with that takes some advice. And it's important here that it takes advice, right? Don't think of a normal Turing machine. So uh, let L be uh, in there. So so there exists a poly sized circuit family. Uh, C0, C1, C2, right? And each of these are bounded uh, in size by a polynomial, and they decide L. Can we give a polynomial advice machine? It, the machine runs in polynomial time, and it takes on at most polynomial advice. This one is a little trickier, but it has a shorter answer, it turns out. It's like a simulate a circuit on its own. Perfect. Website. The advice is the circuit. And then the Turing machine is just some fixed Turing machine which runs its input on the circuit. Certainly, if you have an input and a circuit as text, as, as code, not hard-coded in some way, so you can simulate the circuit on the, on the input in polynomial time if it's a polynomial size circuit, certainly. It's like linear time, constant time per gate, right? So it should be linear time to simulate a circuit on, uh, on input. So the advice is the circuit. Is that clear? Any, I need to make any more adjustments here? The Turing machine, just to be sure, the machine itself is going to be fixed. All it does is simulate the input on the circuit, and the circuit is given to it as the advice. Okay. So we've proven a contained in both ways, and we have now finished the fact that uh, p slash poly, the machines which take polynomial time Turing machines, take polynomial advice, is equivalent to the class uh, which have polynomial size circuits. Awesome. Beautiful proof. Now, let's relate this back to um, the uniform models of computation, right? p slash poly is different than p. What is the difference between, what do we think we know about p uh, versus p slash poly. So we have uniform computation and we have non-uniform computation. What do we think the relationship between those two classes is? P is contained in p poly. Let's give two proofs of it using both definitions. Why is every polynomial time algorithm a polynomial time advice machine? Ignore the advice. Ignore the advice. Why is every polynomial time algorithm? Why does every polynomial time algorithm have polynomial size circuits? We, yeah, we 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 proved it previously. So just to be clear, I'll write this say it out. Uh, first, using the definition advice is ignore ignore advice, and it's done, right? Uh, and the second definition is the fact that we proved that time of f of n. We like quote unquote proved it, right? We just said we proved it. Is uh, a subset of size uh, f squared of n, and then of course I also said it was f f of n log f of n. Um, polynomial there, polynomial there, polynomial done. Okay. Um, do we think they're equal? That's a hard one. That's a scr head scratcher. For reference, I thought they were equal when I was learning this. So they're not equal. They're not equal. Why aren't they equal? Because you have the advice. Um, so I assume if you, the advice is, co is given in constant time. It's just be it just begins with it. it. You're just born with it. It's right. just sitting there. Certainly, intuitively, if you go forget the circuit definition and think about the advice definition. Advice has to give power. So it probably has to be strict. It probably has measurable power. We go back to the circuit definition, things get more complicated, because by Turing completeness, all these, all these mechanical, excuse me, these uniform models are, can simulate each other within a polynomial thing. So to say that the polynomial circuit families are somehow strictly greater than the polynomial time Turing machines is not nice. So it fits with the advice definition by, by the fact that it's strict, it, it fits with the advice definition, but it should not fit comfortably with the circuit definition. But it turns out it's still true. Um, the answer is that p slash poly contains uh, undecidable languages. It turns out that's sufficient. sufficient. Um, we won't prove it, but every uh, 
unary language is in uh, p slash poly. Recall a unary language is one that's not encoded in binary. It's one's encoded with just once. So every string in unary quite literally looks like a pile of sticks. You know, it was the greatest invention of mankind before fire, before they, you ran out of fingers and then you started doing binary like that, right? So uh, then, then you can represent 1,000 numbers on 10 fingers instead of 10. So by making the lengths of objects exponentially longer, you've made the sizes of the circuits smaller, quote unquote. So every unary language is in p slash poly, every single one of them. So just take halt and encode it into unary. So like, I'll call it uhalt, uhal, is just uh, one to the m comma w, and that's in the length of it. one is a number which represents a machine in a word such that uh, m halt on w. Certainly this language is undecidable, and we could prove it by reduction to halt, just do a simple conversion. But it's also unary. So by definition, it has to be, it has to have a polynomial size circuit family. And again, this relies on the fact that we don't require uh, uh, that the function which takes on n and outputs the circuit of, length, of size, the, the nth circuit, we don't require this function to be computable. So we don't actually know how to find such a circuit family for halt. If we knew how to find the circuit family and actually write down the circuit family, of course we could decide halt. But we don't know how to decide halt, so we, don't, we can't. So such a function is uncomputable. It's not, not computable, certainly. But that's not the spirit of the problem. And this relaxation of allowing undecidable, um, you, you just have to say the circuit family exists rather than there exists a way to compute the circuit family. Because then you're studying uniform computation again. You'd be end up studying the synthesis algorithms rather than the sizes of the circuits, necessarily. And that's not the spirit of, the, that's not the spirit of uh, what we want, want to do. So, Given that this language is in p slash poly, and by the way, why is this language not in p? This is a quick, quick uh, definitional one. This is the language of all machines that halt? Correct. p only contains decidable languages. Right? If they halt at a polynomial number of steps, they have to halt. So it's, all the, it's a subset of the decidable languages. So we, therefore, we can conclude that there exists a language which is in p slash poly. I won't write it that way. That was, would be annoying. Double slashes. Um, so certainly, this is a language that exists in, not in p. It can't be in p, because p is decidable languages. But it does exist in p slash poly. So uh, in terms of like a Venn diagram, this is really hard to fit in there. So like if this was p uh, and this was np, we're not sure what the overlap is yet between NP and P slash poly because you're studying now different models. So the bad way that I like to draw it might be like this. Right? So it's kind of goofy looking. But uh, and it's not clear if there's any overlap between NP and P slash poly at all. So it's not, it's, not, it's not accurate to have a diagram like this. But certainly it's at least funny. Okay, any questions on Boolean circuits? Next, after the break, we're going to talk about circuit lower bounds and the complexity of circuits. This is sort of, uh, uh, we know, we understand thoroughly what this, at least in complexity theory, uh, what the model of Boolean circuits is, you know. Cool. Let's take a little break. <laughs>